All right, welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the college. Um, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. Then we'll have our uh, infamous speech. And then we'll go from there to questions and answers. And then we'll go to our rebuttal period where you'll each get a chance to spot off for a certain amount of time, whether it be on or off subject. And uh, there's two rules to the college. One is one fool at a time. Second is no personal text. That means I can't call Charlie a schmuck, but it has been known to happen. So anyway, with that, Charlie, let's get the announcements started, okay? All right. Welcome everyone to meeting number 3,662 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, uh, first of all, a little uh, announce, uh, reminder, uh, we have at the, if you go to our main website, we have a Google email group, which I recommend you join to get updates on upcoming programs. And we also have a meetup group, which functions in very much the same fashion, one or two uh, bulletins on the upcoming uh, speaker and topics. So sign up uh, for either of those uh, uh, to keep in touch with what we're discussing. Now, although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Now we have two more programs uh, in addition to the one this evening in our series of special Earth Day speakers. Next week, we are hosting the candidates for the, the Green Party candidates for the Water Reclamation District. Uh, should be an intriguing program, exciting candidates. Uh, Tonio and Mark, uh, pretty good candidates this year we've, we, we managed to put up. So learn about the Illinois Green Party next week. Following that on April the 30th, we're going to take a look at, is there a primitive species living in the forest of the United States and the need to preserve and restore their habitat? This is largely going to be a two-part program uh, with a lot of focus on the current status of the forest covering our nation and the end of lumber industry, which would remove those forests. Anyhow, uh, uh, okay, that's on the 30th in conjunction with National Arbor Day. Uh, transitioning into May, our special May Day speaker, this is the North American president. Recording we looked out okay. the current president of the IWW, the industrial workers of the world. We'll be telling talking about the history and culture of the wobblies and the condition of labor in the United States today. So that's our May Day program, comrades. Don't miss it. On May the 14th, the Truth Brigade will be here to help a number of you ascertain from what is true, from what is false. I have no problem doing so, but some of you do. So the Truth Brigade will be here on May the 14th. On May the 21st, please advance, Tim. Um, he's on the phone. On May the 21st, we're going to be taking a look at health disparities in public health policies and concerns regarding long COVID, which is a, uh, a, a condition result uh, of the pandemic. So health disparities on May 21st. On May the 8th, 28th, we're gonna look at efforts to stop uh, combat. There's a movement by certain I'll call them right-wing uh, people. Uh, they are causing disruptions. They uh, are concerned about the anti-vaccination. Uh, they want an anti-vaccination campaigns and they want to control the curriculum of schools regarding such things as 
CRT, critical race theory. So that should be an interesting program. On June the 4th, uh, we're gonna have Bob Matter, or not Bob Matter, but Bob Lichtenberg. Uh, Professor Lichtenberg has authored a number of books on establishing meaning, the importance of having a meaningful life. So this is a program that could prove beneficial to everyone and have universal appeal. The next open dates are June 11, 18, and 25. So we hope to, if you have a topic, please let us know and we'll take a look at it and maybe get you on the schedule. All right, Tim, that's about it. Say, by the way, tell everybody, yeah, did, did, uh, explain the format. So thank well, you. I, I, I did it. I did a little. I did a little bit earlier, but again, just a reminder: we'll have uh, our announcements period is over. Our speaker will then speak, and then we'll have a question and answer period. And afterwards, we will then get into our uh, rebuttal period, where everybody will get a little bit to speak. A couple more brief announcements while we're on that same uh, on that same line. Our Dallas does have a campus. They meet on Thursday nights, and. Uh, they also start at seven o'clock. You can get the Zoom link there to the Dallas campus website. I'll briefly share their screen on this real quick, if you don't mind, Thank Charlie, you. and then we'll get right to it. Well, there's nothing to show. Well, they don't have uh, a just, speaker yet. Okay, well, um, and then of course, uh, <laughs> oh, well, anyway, we also have a Facebook page and whatever. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm beginning to lose it here. Um, Alan, if you're ready, uh, Let's get started. Well, during his presentation, we just ask you to mute during the presentation. We'll take questions after the presentation, and then we'll get into a rebuttal period. So, Alan, uh, the floor is now yours. Um, take it away. Let's welcome our speaker. Okay. Good evening, everyone. So, uh, this evening's topic is on green hydrogen, and as you probably are aware, we're our Planets is hoping to get to a net zero uh, carbon usage by around the middle of this uh, century. And obviously there's a lot of different sectors of the economy and um, other types of um, activities on planet earth that use carbon currently. And so they're gonna have to have a lot of different uh, potential solutions for different areas. But I just want to focus on the potential role that um, green hydrogen could have in getting us to that net zero carbon usage. So first, let's uh, look a little introduction as with regard to hydrogen. Um, as many of you may already know, hydrogen is the lightest element, less dense than air. It's, it's obviously it's not toxic. You can't see it. Uh, it's odorless, you can't taste it. Um, if it does leak, it will rise and diffuse. So unlike some other things that were cause toxic spills, this would not be the case with hydrogen. On our planet, it basically, it's a prevalent uh, chemical, but it's basically found in chemical compounds such as hydrocarbons and water. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at different types of hydrogen. Uh, obviously we're looking at green hydrogen as a focus here and hydrogen uh, can be made by electrolysis, uh, which is a process that sends electric current through water to separate the hydrogen atoms from the oxygen ones. And to count as green uh, hydrogen, or if you wanna call it carbon-free hydrogen, uh, the electricity that's used in, electro in the electrolyzer must come from, a, uh, from renewable sources. Now, currently, most of the hydrogen that's used as a fuel is uh, derived from splitting it off from molecules of natural gas. Uh, that's adverse in that it both requires energy uh, in that process, and it also produces carbon dioxide. Uh, and this has led it to be called gray hydrogen. Another type of hydrogen that's been discussed is, is called blue hydrogen. And this is a name used if the 
uh, carbon dioxide produced is captured and stored. Now, this could be either if they were splitting it off from a natural gas, you know, capturing that hydro uh, uh, carbon dioxide there, or if it was you were using something other than renewable energy in, you know, the uh, electricity, uh, then, you know, capturing the uh, the carbon dioxide there. So any of those ways, if it's you're trying to capture it, that would be called, uh, it would be considered a, a low emission fuel, not as good as uh, green hydrogen, but better than gray hydrogen. I Most of us would think it's kind of crazy to uh, be investing in uh, infrastructure and so forth for producing blue hydrogen when you can go to green hydrogen. But there are, industrial interests that would like to use blue hydrogen. Okay, now, why would we want green hydrogen? There was a number of ways that it could help us with, uh, you know, dealing with getting to net zero carbon. One major area is transportation. Uh, transportation accounts for about 16% of the world's carbon emissions. Now about two thirds of that, um, could be effectively addressed by electrifying the, the modes of transportation and then using uh, you know, renewable energy for the production of that uh, electricity. However, about a, however, commercial aviation and cargo and cruise ships and long haul trucking uh, account for about one third of transport. And those forms of transport cannot be electrified, at least not anywhere in the near future unless you come up with some uh, you know great changes in battery weights and so forth which we don't foresee right now anyway so those types of transportation cannot be electrified due to the weight and the volume of the batteries that would be required for those types of transport of uh, modes of transportation and so that's going to require some kind of carbon free fuel and green hydrogen uh, could be the solution. Um, now, many of you have heard of Airbus, which is a European uh, aircraft designer and manufacturer, and it has announced that it has plans to develop a uh, commercial aircraft by, nine, by 2035 that will uh, run on green hydrogen. So that's one step forward in that area. Another area that's of concern is um, heavy industries, uh, both in steel making and various other industries. They, there are needs for very high temperatures. Uh, it's 20, over 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit, around 1,500 in Celsius, uh, that they need for furnaces. Uh, and that is a temperature that electricity cannot generate. Uh, so in steel making, Green hydrogen could be used to replace the coal that is now being used in not only in the furnaces, but also to purify the iron ore. Now there's a uh, fairly small Swedish steel maker uh, called Hybrid and, uh, that makes steel for Volvo. And last year it shifted over from coal to green hydrogen to fuel its uh, steel making process. Uh, so that's a step forward. And hopefully that <laughs> can become much more widespread in the years uh, ahead. Okay. Now, another area where green hydrogen could play a role is improved battle batteries. Uh, the world needs improved batteries to store energy gen generated by renewable energy sources so that you can have carbon fuel, carbon free energy uh, that can be used when you don't have the sun shining and you don't have the wind blowing. And now green hydrogen fuel cells are one of the options under consideration, uh, particularly for homeowners and other small scale solar generation generators who may want to dis disconnect from the grid. And another area 
is simply to replace gray hydrogen. Uh, uh, the current gray hydrogen product uh, generates between 830 and 1,000 million tons of CO2 annually. So if you can shift over and eliminate that CO2 uh, by changing that hydrogen product to green hydrogen, uh, that's going to be obviously quite helpful in eliminating that part of the uh, uh, carbon. We've got some feedback here. So if you can mute the, the party that's got the uh, feed, background feedback. Hello. Can you mute the party that's got the background noise? Thank you. Okay, now we've got a variety of hurdles to the use of green hydrogen. Um, first of all, let's look at cost competitiveness and things like that. Um, green hydrogen currently costs between uh, $2.50 and $4.50 a kilogram to make, uh, according to analysis by uh, the Bloomberg New Energy Finance Group, sometimes referred to as the Bloomberg NEF or BNEF. Uh, and that would need to, that kind of cost would need to fall below a dollar a kilogram to become competitive with hydrogen made from fossil fuel. And BNF projects that green hydrogen will reach that level by 2030, but uh, that will hinge on both a vast expansion of electrolyzer capacity and vast increase in clean electricity generation. Now, uh, within the last year, uh, researchers at the uh, University of, of Wollongong in Australia have come up with a new design for electrolyzers that would increase their efficiency from 75% uh, to 95%. And uh, there's a new uh, startup company in Australia called uh, Hystra. And they have kind of purchased the rights to this new technology, and they are now gathering the funding to uh, you know, build a factory to start uh, you know, building these new electrolyzers. They expect that factory to be up and running by the end of 2023, which is next year. And at once everything's running smoothly there, then they plan to expand and build additional factories, both in Australia and around the world. So, uh, and it's expected that that new, uh, technology design will drop the cost uh, for green hydrogen to about uh, roughly $1.60 in US dollars. So that's a step in the right direction toward cost competitiveness. Now, another problem is distribution, another hurdle, let's say. Uh, so hydrogen needs to be compressed if you're gonna send it through a pipeline or chill to a liquid state if you're gonna ship it, transport it by ship. Uh, this, so this adds to the costs uh, compared to natural gas. So that's an issue. Um, some of the current natural gas pipelines uh, could be switched over to serve as green hydrogen pipelines. Though the pipes would need to be strengthened as hydrogen causes steel pipes to become brittle and crack. Now the pipeline industry has these things called, uh, robots called pigs that they send through pipelines to inspect for leaks, do other maintenance. And these could be used to send in and coat the insides of the pipes to strengthen them. So that's how that would work out. But ultimately, uh, new pipes for green hydrogen uh, could be built. And that is now uh, being done in Europe. Okay, now let's move on to the rollout. Uh, first, looking at Europe. Uh, the European Union has set the most ambitious goal uh, 
building electrolyzers that have capacity of converting 40 gigawatts of renewable energy into green hydrogen by 2030. Uh, the, the EU has made green hydrogen a central component of its Green Deal plan. Uh, the EU is uh, envisioning as much as 560 billion of uh, both public and private investments uh, by the middle of this century in the hope of kickstarting a global green hydrogen market. And Germany has declared that green hydrogen will play a central role in transforming the country's industrial base uh, as it moves toward its goal of having a zero carbon economy by 2045. Now, uh, now we look at rolling out green hydrogen elsewhere on this planet. Uh, South Korea is building fueling and other infrastructure in six of its cities where it hopes to make green hydrogen the main energy source by 2025. And Australia is going to invest 214 million to develop four green hydrogen hubs uh, with capacity for uh, 26 gigawatts of green hydrogen capacity. And in the US, uh, our president has, uh, or the Biden administration has set a goal of reducing the cost of green hydrogen by 80% by the end of this decade. Okay, now as far as cost competitiveness, the uh, Bloomberg NEF group, uh, Per them, the, the, the cost of electricity is going to account for the majority of the costs of producing green hydrogen by the year 2030, with electrolyzer related costs accounting for the rest. And uh, again, by a study that they did of, in 28 major uh, countries, um, green hydrogen should compete with hydrogen made from natural gas by 2050 in all of those 28 major uh, countries that they studied. And it would even cost less than natural gas on an energy equivalent basis in 15 of those 28 countries. So that is basically my short and sweet presentation uh, to show the role that uh, green hydrogen could uh, play in getting us to uh, net zero carbon usage. And it's obviously, you know, some of this may develop and some of it may not. That is always the way in, in any transition, but it certainly could be a player in, uh, you know, getting us to a solution. So with that, I guess we're gonna open it up for Q's and A's. And I guess I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you, Thank Alan, you. for doing this. And I'm sure a lot of us have questions. Um, I'm going to do the first one if, if, if nobody else has it. Go ahead and unmute everybody if you need to. Um, and uh, the first thing I'd like to ask you is, if hydrogen is so good, why haven't we seen enough hydrogen-powered cars yet or anything like that running these cars? I mean, like we are seeing the widespread adoption of electric cars right now. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, there are the hurdles. I went through the various hurdles, the cost comparison. There's a lot of infrastructure and so forth. Um, so we've got to uh, tackle those hurdles in order to get to be able to use it uh, more broadly. And at this point, uh, for two thirds of the uh, transportation sector, which includes cars <laughs> and a various a number of other forms of transportation, uh, electricity is looks like it's going to be the, the preferred way of getting us to a, a carbon-free transportation. So, electricity for you know that technology is developed, the infrastructure is rolling out, and that looks like that's going to be the way. So, but there's those thing parts of transportation that you know that I pointed out that where batteries is you know an electricity electrification is not going to be solution. And so for that portion of the transportation sector, uh, 
we have to look for something else. And green hydrogen could be the solution. There could be some other, uh, you know, biofuels that are developed that could be the solution also. So, um, but, you know, but for, for transportation at this point, electricity, electrification and use of uh, renewable fuels for the, the making of electricity that's used looks like it's going to be the best option. Okay, are you familiar? Are you familiar with the? I'm going to get to you next, Margaret. Are you familiar with the Toyota Mirai? Um, no, I'm not. It's a hydrogen-powered car that uh, it's going to be starting in 2022. That Toyota's making. Um, well, I know they've been trying to do, you know, uh, fuel cells for hydrogen for cars, and some pla places may find that, you know, is uh, an option. But again, at the current point, you, the, the, you don't have the, the, the infrastructure for that. You don't have the uh, cost competitiveness. So the question that I would have is, is that going to, are those hydrogen uh, fuel cells going to be using uh, gray hydrogen? I'm not sure, you know. Okay. I was just curious because, uh, you know, um, all right, Margaret, and then Bob Matter. So Margaret, go ahead. I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on the on the implementation of this you would have <coughs> kind of batteries that would be charged up that would deliver electricity to what trucks or whatever would any right. of them be used for personal cars um there was something about hydrogen where is the hydrogen fuel cell in the process um that those are my questions Okay, so again, again uh, where I'm suggesting that green hydrogen could be the main solution is those types of transportation, large, you know, commercial air aviation or large cargo ships or cruise ships or large, you know, or trucking for long haul trucking, where you have to have a very heavy weight and you got to go a long distance. You, you're going to, those things, you can't, you know, you'd have to use a tr great number of batteries. You add a lot of weight. It's just not practical to use uh, electricity for those modes of transportation. Now, so again, like a, the last question, some people are trying to use, uh, you know, hydrogen fuel cells. And I think a lot of them are they're trying to do it and now. They're using a green, uh, there's this gray hydrogen, which is not clean. And, but in the future, you might be able to go over to uh, green hydrogen. But again, you've got to build out the, infrastructure for that you, and, you know it's not at this point cost competitive you don't have the infrastructure everything like that so um you know i think electrification for small vehicles for small boats for small aircraft even for short distance mm -hmm. is going to be those electrification seems a lot more logical for those you know modes of transportation uh, again two-thirds of the total but it's only the very large uh heavy transportation things uh where you have to go long distances, that electrification is not going to be the answer. And that's where you have to look for something else. Green hydrogen may be the solution. I mean, it's not the only thing that they might come up with, but there are certainly a number of things like the Airbus and other things are looking at green hydrogen for so, some so of those. What would, be, what would be the mechanism of that? How would you use green hydrogen to provide the fuel for uh, a 14 or 18 wheeler or whatever twin. I whatever. can, I, Alan, if I may help out a little bit, yeah. there's a component called the hydrogen fuel cell that take, converts the hydrogen into electricity via a fuel cell technology that helps power the uh, airplane or the uh, truck or whatever. It's just that the hydrogen takes a lot less space and the fuel cell also takes a lot less space, but you'd have to fill the truck with hydrogen at a hydrogen filling station, which there are not too many of right now, but that uses what they call fuel cell technology to power the vehicle. And, and aren't there a real, a real problem with it, with explosions at those things when uh, no, it goes wrong? It, I mean, it, that's what I understand. Well, that sometimes, again, uh, Alan, you might have more information than I do, but um, they're making it safe now because it's all, you know, a lot of times they already transport uh, LNG and propane uh, in a lot of cases like this at high pressure. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, Alan, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think they're, if they're going to use it, they're going to make, you know, designing it in a way that it's, it's pretty safe, you know, 
Uh, I can't say that anything is going to be 100% safe, but they're going to it'll it'll be pretty safe with the designs that they have. And they can also use it in internal combustion engines too. Okay, uh, our next questioner is Bob. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, Alan. Uh, no, I'm just curious. What, uh... Bob, I'm sorry. I accidentally muted you. I was trying to take your hand down. Can you unmute again, please? I'm sorry about that. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, Alan. Um, would would it be possible to retrofit, uh, like you know, container ships, the existing container ships, uh, to uh, adapt to uh, uh, hydrogen technology? Uh, they probably could. There are some uh, shipping companies, cargo shipping companies, that are actually looking at a combination of, um, you know, whether it's a new ship or a retrofit. I think they'll plan it more for new ships when they, you know, change over <laughs> uh, to, you know, they're always going to have to every, you know, ships have a certain lifespan, so they, they could just focus on the new ships, but they could do some retrofit. I'm not sure of the, what the, the cost uh, basis, whether that would make sense, but they're actually trying to do a combination where they'd use green hydrogen plus wind power for sales. And you think, oh, sales is ancient technology, but there are actually some firms that are looking at, um, you know, for cargo ships of trying to use uh, sales for a bit of their, uh, you know, um, sure, why not? Fueling, but it won't cover fuel. <laughs> sales won't do the whole trick, so they're going to use green hydrogen for the rest. But that's that's the plan. But uh, I think the other part of my question is: uh, is there a role for uh, you know clean, safe nuclear uh, energy to uh, create the electricity necessary for the for the you know creation of uh, the hydrogen uh, cells? What safe nuclear energy? <laughs> you know, oh, you know, know. When, when you're using like you know if you're using you know electrolyzers to create the you know get the hydrogen for the green hydrogen if it's coming from a clean source you know and this could be renewable sources uh, it could be nuclear uh, you know if, if you know anything that's not you know creating co2 when it's creating the electricity the way, would be considered a clean source. Very good so, um, you know, it would be possible to do it from uh, a nuclear, you know, generator of some type. Okay. Hello? Yes. So Robert, are you done? Hello? Yeah, I think he's done. I think you got Ellen next hand up. Let's go, Hello. Ellen. We yeah, hi. Okay. Um, yes, hi, I'm Ellen Corley. Um, yeah, Alan, um, it's interesting your talk. I used to work at People's Energy back in the early 2000s, and we were developing uh, hydrogen fuel cells. That was a real big area. And um, I remember they said that if Al Gore had gotten in, our chances of getting anything done were better. But uh, I'm wondering, what is your background? What Whoever Robert is, they're interfering. Yeah, it's a little hard to hear. Uh, so Ellen, I've just researched this on my own. My, my, my career was with the uh, Social Security Administration. I had a 35 year career and I'm retired. So I'm not a physicist or anything else, but it's just an area that I, you know, research a number of papers and, and you know, is looking at this as a, uh, a topic that a lot of people would be interested in because I see it as a potential solution for one, you know, for some segments of our economy where we use, uh, you know, carbon fuels today. So, and a lot of people didn't know anything about it and or very little about it. So I thought a presentation, you know, writing a, you know, a paper, uh, which I did for a certain group, and then you know, creating the uh, PowerPoint to help with the presentation would be, you know, a way of educating uh, more of the public about this possibility. So that's it. Uh, but realistically, I don't know who did you write the paper for, and and you know, that's what a, are the barriers and likelihood of? I wrote the paper for a group called the uh, the Environmental Task Force of Unitarian Universalists for Social Justice, and we do these various edu 
environmental education pieces, and then we distribute them through UU churches around the country and, and so forth. And you know, we also send them to various uh, environmental groups in this area in case they want to use them for whatever, you know, their newsletters or their, uh, you know, <laughs> any any uh, way they have of distributing it. So it's, it's their choice, but we, we just try to distribute them to those two also. So it's just one of a series of papers that we've done on all that environmental issues over the uh, years. All right. All right, uh, all right Alan, let's move on happened? to, uh, do you have any more okay. questions, Alan? Yeah, I wanted to know what, did you get any sense of what the impact would be of this, of this technology? On, on uh, is it too late with the environmental global warming? Um, that would be my fear. But uh, I mean, do you have a sense of the impact of this? Well, <laughs> Green hydrogen, again, is just one piece of many possible solutions for different parts of the uh, economy, or, you know, and until, you know, it's going to take some time. <laughs> it's, it's not here where we're going to use it in, in, in any large scale right now. It's, it's going to have to be rolled out. I, I mentioned the various hurdles they're going to be working on uh, overcoming, and there's various places that are starting to, you know, a small steel maker in Sweden and the Airbus trying to design commercial aircrafts that will use green hydrogen. So there's various places that are working on this. And, you know, again, the European Union's got, you know, plans to have it as a, a major part of their solution to getting to, uh, net zero carbon. So, you know, it's a piece of the puzzle, you know, a piece of solving this puzzle of getting us off of carbon. And, you know, and that's it, you know, but it's not, it's not something that's a major factor today and only time will tell the exact extent. I expect it will play a role and be a, a part of the solution, but you know, uh, how big a role it will f and be in the long run, when I say long run, let's say 20, at 2050, uh, you know, time will tell on that, but it, it certainly has possibilities and I expect it'll be part of the solution, um, but you know, how big that part will be, will, time will tell. Okay, uh, let's move on to our next questioner, Jake. I think that's you at 2935. Okay, got a couple questions. Could you repeat your name and affiliation again? I didn't catch it. My name is Alan Lindrup. And okay. this paper was put together um, at, for the Environmental Task Force of the Unitarian Universalists for Social Justice, which is a nonprofit. Oh, okay, okay, University Unitarian. Okay. All right. And um, okay, but you don't you don't have a technical background per se. No. Okay. So this is my my real my main question is um, uh, how should I put it? Um, how 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 do you find green hydrogen? What is it, and, and how does it work? And how do you produ how do you how do you create it? Well, I, I I covered all that in the presentation. The green. The well, green you went through it. So by, by, I, I, I didn't have really an electrolyzer. It, so. It's created by yeah. having an electrolyzer and, and the process is electrolysis. You split off, you take water and you, you split the hydrogen atoms off from the, uh, from the oxygen ones. And that's how you get, and if, you ha if in, the, in that process, the electricity that you use in, in that process, if it comes from a renewable, renewable energy source, and not from uh, you know, fossil fuels, then that's considered green hydrogen. So that that's how it's made. All right. So you so, oh, okay. So you use so in other words, you use electricity to split off the hydrogen. Yeah. Split the hydrogen. Take wa yeah. ordinary water and split hydrogen mm -hmm. from oxygen, and then so what form does what form is the so you can use any form. So in other words, you need an outside power source in order to in order to make yeah, it happen. You use you have to you're using electricity to run the ele electrolyzer. Right. Uh, uh, and so, you know, you got to get that electricity from some source. <laughs> and, and if you're, right. you, know, you could be using fossil fuels or you could be using renewable energy. And to be really qualify as green hydrogen, right. you have to have a carbon, okay. carbon free electricity to, right. you know, okay. to do the process. Okay. How much, how much, how much electricity does it use? How much electricity does it require to, to do it? Um, well, <laughs> that probably depends on, on you know, how, how 
big the facility is that you're uh, using. You know, if you know if you have a thing where you got a lot of different. Uh, well, say uh, per say per gallon say per gallon of water. You say I have like five hundred gallons of water. How much would it take? How much electricity would it take to split off the hydrogen? I, I can't answer that. I don't know. But obviously, okay. the more your more electrolyzers you're using, the bigger facility you're doing, the bigger you know, the more electricity you're going to use. Uh, you know. Right. Okay. But, and, and so, gonna, and so when you when you do that, what form does the hydrogen take? Is it is it still is it still a gas or does yeah, it it's, come it, it comes off as a as a gas. Right. Okay. And then you store the gas in a tank. It can be stored in a tank, right? And then again, if it, it if it's going to be transported, uh, you know, then it's it's either going to be have to be compressed to go through pipelines, or it has to be chilled enough to be uh, become a liquid state to uh, you know go in containers, you know, that will keep it cold <laughs> while it's being transported. So, oh, so you could you could cool it down into a liquid form. Yeah, let's right. move on. Okay. All right, uh, Brian. Wait, 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 one other question. Get a couple more questions, please. You only please. get one question, Jake. Okay, I'll come back later. Thanks. All right, okay. thanks. All right thanks, Jake. Brian, you're next. Brian, you are up next, I believe, unless you're still with us. So, so is the Unitarian Universalist uh, Social Justice uh, Group are are they advocating for the government to get involved in this? Like, if it's if it has potential to get people or companies off of fossil fuels, use water rather than gas, I'm sure everyone would jump at that chance. I mean, so to what extent are you looking for government to subsidize the creation of this tech or, you know, kind of refinement of that technology? Well, I mean, we, we don't specifically, we're hoping, <laughs> again, we support the goal of getting to, to a carbon free economy and whether, you know, most likely, it, there's going to be some uh, governmental support for this process. But if if non-governmental en entities with companies or whatever paid for it all, I mean, wouldn't we we're not opposed to that? We'd like to see solutions to the use of, of carbon in our current economy, and wherever those sort, you know, however that's funded, is fine. You know, more, a lot of times it's going to be a combination of government funds and you know. Uh, <coughs> foundations, corporations, other things, just like in Europe, they expect to have a, you know, a combination of government funding and private source funding. And that's probably would be the case in the United States too. Uh, but we're not, you know, trying to advocate for, you know, just government funding or any, or private funding or anything like that. We just try to encourage, you know, solutions to uh, the problem of getting us off of carbon usage. Thank you. Okay, uh, Charlie, you're next. Yes, wouldn't adoption, they say one of the arguments for nuclear reactors is that it's necessary for heavy in industry. Now, if we adopted green hydrogen, wouldn't that enable us to shut down every nuclear reactor in the state of Illinois? And number two, wouldn't, if they had progressive leadership, in states like Indiana, wouldn't that revitalize the Northwest corner, the steel industry, uh, if they had leaders with uh, foresight in Indiana? Okay, so you're, you got a couple of different questions here. I mean, getting us off of, you know, car, uh, fossil fuels is gonna take some time as we all know, and whether, nuclear energy stays in that picture, or we are able to use renewable sources that eliminate the need for fossil fuels. Uh, you know, a lot of us are concerned with various issues in nuclear, uh, nuclear industries and nuclear reactors. And, uh, you know, and it's also very un, uh, cost competitive at this point. So it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but some people think that nuclear, uh, you know, reactors and using them as part of the solution. Um, you know, we're not arguing necessarily that you can't use nuclear, but that's really not, you know, our, our preference for, for uh, 
having a, a carbon-free economy. But you know, there's some people who argue that, that you know they're going to be nuclear reactors uh, and nuclear energy will be uh, for for electricity generation will be part of the solution. But I guess time will tell on that. But there's a lot of negatives that the nuclear energy industry has that uh, argue against its usage. But uh, again, we'll see. Okay, I know. I think Rolando's left us, but he did have his hand up. So. I guess I'll go with Ernie and then Bob Matter. Ernie, go ahead. Hi. Yeah, a couple quick, quick, quick ones here. One, well, I'll, I'll go with an extra because a friend, who, Doug Binkley, was supposed to be here and he couldn't make it. He had a question. His question was, um, uh, doesn't hydrogen have a, a, a tendency to leak? And can it, it can even leak through certain metals? And uh, he, he, he thought this would be a problem to the adoption of hydrogen. My other question is when you get hydrogen, let's say you have it in a vehicle, do you pump it just like gas, the liquid from a tank into your vehicle's tank? Is that the way that that works? Okay, so you got the two questions. First, yeah, it, uh, the issue of leaks, I mentioned that uh, like pipes that, you know, have to, you have to have a very, uh, uh, containers that can hold it and, and a lot of the pipes that we they have for piping like natural gas, if they want to convert them, they've got to strengthen them because okay. it, it does have a tendency to, if you just have steel, you know, to make it, it brittle and, and, and then you can get leaks and so forth. So you do have to have strong containers, but it's not an impossible yeah, they, thing. They, they coat them like coat them with glass or some other substance or, or is that not an, a, a, a good way to do it? Yeah, they do coat them. I'm, I'm not sure the exact chemical texture okay. of that uh, coating that, but they have to strengthen. You can't have just straight steel. Um, okay. But let's see, your your other question was on, repeat how again. Or how do you deliver the stuff to the vehicle that's going to use it? Yeah, I mean, you would have, you have to have an infrastructure where it is either piped or uh, transported probably in a liquid state and then converted over to, uh, most likely to a gas form again at that place. But yeah, it would be, uh, pumped into your vehicle, but you'd have to have obviously the storage capacity for, uh, with that's appropriate for storing hydrogen in your vehicle. Yeah, if, if I have a truck, I drive into one of these stations and, and yeah. it'll pump similar to, to the way we now pump gas, not not transferring an entire new tank. Right. Or is that, or is that a possible way too? I don't think, no, you you wouldn't transfer in a new tank, but I, you know, I guess something like that, if you, might be developed, but I, I you know, it would have to be very, it would be strange where you remove a tank and put a whole new tank in. I, I think they, as far as I know, it, it would be pumped. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so Bob, you're next. And then yeah, we'll Alan, um, can, can you use uh, salt water, uh, or, you know, ocean water to uh, extract this hydrogen? Yeah. And is there any difference in the amount of energy it takes to extract from salt water versus fresh water? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I don't think it does, but I, there might be a change, difference. Okay, uh, is, that, is that it, Bob? Yeah. All right, Jake, go ahead. Uh, just to continue that, if you're, if you're going to use salt water, could you use uh, reverse osmosis as a way of extracting the hydrogen, or will that not work? I mean, you're 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 using the water in an electrolyzer to to uh, split right. off the right. hydrogen atoms, and and you so right. you're you know, uh, right. you know you're doing a reverse osmosis. This is a technology developed by the Navy to extract. Uh, to extract sodium and other heavy minerals from seawater, so they can so that you can drink it. Yeah, well, the process they have for, you know, there might be other processes that could break off hydrogen from water, but the main one that's that's used is these electrolyzers. So, okay, uh, you know, you said if you if you take the hydrogen and turn it into to liquefy it it means it has to be cooled down you know yeah. do you know what temperature it has to be cooled down to 
Uh, I don't know the exact temperature, but it's it's you know, it's probably something like you know at least maybe fifty below Celsius, something like that. It's pretty, quite chilly. Okay, so so it would be super cold, super cold. So how much electricity would that take? Do you know? I don't know. Okay. Um, but so if you're if you're taking hydrogen and putting it in a car or truck or plane, um, w would you pump it in like you do at a gas station, or how would that work? As far as I know, yes, it would be pumped in. Okay. The other thing is the hydrogen fuel cells. My understanding about hydrogen fuel cells, they work on they they use ordinary gasoline. They chemically separate out the hydrogen from the oxygen, recombine them to form a electrical spark and then you get a little water and, and uh, water and uh, uh, CO2 coming out the gas tank. Um, but one, one of the problems with the hydrogen fuel cell, I'm told, is that it can create an explosion. Yeah, well, I, they, you know, they've been improving the tanks and so forth uh, for safety, yeah. uh, you know, through the yeah. years. So that's okay. supposed to be a very small risk. Who's next on the uh, thing? I guess Charlie's next after Jake. So go ahead, Charlie. Yes, Alan. I saw an article that the Canadian Pacific Railroad is looking to develop a green hydrogen-powered locomotive. Uh, wouldn't it be possible to transport uh, uh, hydrogen by rail using uh, yes. railroad tank cars and green locomotives? Yeah, it would probably have- pretty ecological? Yeah, it would be possible. But again, you know, most of the time, uh, you know, you either have to have it, if you're gonna keep it in a gas, it has to have a very, you know, uh, 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 appropriate, um, you know, storage thing where it's not gonna leak or, or you can convert it into a liquid form for transportation. Okay. Um. All right. Did that answer your question, Charlie, or do you still have more? Yeah. Yeah. I, I I'm looking to see a network the entire nation supplied by clean energy by rail. Let's let's do it. Um. Okay. Do you have any idea, Steve? How much? I'm sorry. Anybody else have any questions before I go in? All right. Do you have any idea how much a renewable wind farm or renewable solar farm might make as far as hydrogen is concerned? Or have you done your research yet on that? You talking to me? Yes. Okay. Um, this, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Why don't, why don't you repeat the question? I'm not sure that I... I'm just wondering how much hydrogen will be produced through a... Um, through a... Uh, through the various energy forms from a renewable uh, hydrogen or a solar power plant on a commercial scale, do you know how much and what it, what it could cover as far as uh, the energy equivalent of oil or anything like that? Well, you know, how many electrolyzers you need, how big a facility? I mean, the more the bigger the facility you have for doing the uh, splitting off of uh, the hydrogen molecules, the more electricity you're going to use. And, you know, you're obviously going to transport the electricity to the place where they're doing that splitting off, uh, where and that, you know, that could be close to a wind farm or um, a solar field or whatever like that. But it, it could be further distance. You, you know, if you're using electricity. Electricity has to be transported either long distance or short distance to where the facility where they're do, having you know the large scale. Uh, electrolysis being done to, you know, create the green hydrogen. Okay. Um, all right. Anybody else have any questions real quick? Cause I don't see any more hands up. Uh, Jake, anybody else have any more questions? All right, Jake, go ahead. Uh, I'll try to think of my question here. Um, I forgot my question. I'll come back to it. Um, have you, uh, how long have you been into this uh, hydrogen thing, Alan? 
Uh, I would say about a year I've been, you know, researching and then, you know, mm -hmm. putting the paper together and then doing this. So now, again, I've, been, I've been an environmentalist for a long time. And then it's just, you know, well, you, you read various books like the book Drawdown and so forth to look at various solutions to, you know, uh, getting us to net zero carbon and trying to eliminate carbon. So, that, you know, just a lot of use carbon in a lot of parts of the uh, economy and, and um you know, you have to have solutions and there's a lot of different things that can contribute to solving the, the, the problem. And, um, you know, green hydrogen, again, as I said before, is appears to be a, a possible solution for some of the areas where, where we have to get rid of carbon and that, you know, we don't have another good solution at this point. So uh, it's a possible, you know, part of the uh, solution, uh, the overall solution, you know? So uh, it's not gonna, it's not the thing that's, it's not gonna be the majority solution for, you know, <laughs> the issue, but there are parts, areas where it can be the solution, but there's gotta be hurdles that, um, you know, need to be overcome before we get to using it. It's not, uh, you know, it's not gonna be used on any wide scale at this point, uh, there are places like I mentioned, the steel maker in in uh, Sweden and so forth that are starting to use green hydrogen in, in steel making and so forth like that. So, but again, these are, are small scale at this point, and to to get broad broad scale and everything, you've got to build up you know the infrastructure and you know and both for making for having the electrolysis <laughs> to you know create the green hydrogen on a, on a broad scale and then have the infrastructure for getting it, transporting it, moving it to the places where it's going to be needed. So, I mean, all of this takes time to develop. Okay. Um, Tell us one. I remember, I, I remember okay. my question. All right. I my uh, question. All right. Okay. Well, I have, uh, all right. We had two more people go up, but Jake, you were first. So go ahead. Then we'll go back to Charlie okay. and then back to Bob. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, hydrogen is supposed to be used as a replacement for, I mean, it's supposed to be carbon free fuel. Is, are there any, have they, in the, in the test, are, are there any other um, environmental hazards that can be, that can be associated with burning, with using it? Well, you certainly don't have the issue of, of, of the leaks being a, a hazard, but I mean, if you, you didn't have proper containment facilities or whatever, you know, in the past, there have been issues of some, uh, you know, uh, issues with storage that could, uh, I guess, result in, uh, you know, uh, explosions and so forth. But I think they've pretty well overcome that as far as the uh, technology for, for storing it. But it's mainly an issue of developing the infrastructure and developing the no, that, 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 isn't, what, that, was, broad scale. that, that isn't that isn't what I was asking. Okay. I was asking you, you think because obviously uh, uh, gasoline uh, releases a lot of CO two. Could this release other environmental hazards other than CO two? Uh, no, it's basically the process. You, it basically creates water water vapor is what gets you know. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, one other question too. If you're using it in a car or a truck uh, or a bus for that matter, any kind of motor vehicle, what kind of engine would you need in order to burn it? Or does it burn? Does it burn or does it create an electrical charge? How would that yeah. work? As I understand it, it is burnt, but again, you know, I, I, I well, some people might want to try to use it for, for, for autos. I don't think it's going to be the answer for an auto. It's going to be mainly for large uh, modes of transportation where, you know, like the commercial aviation or cargo ships, things like that, where, you know, you can't really uh, electrify them. Oh, so not for trucks, not for trucks or buses. Trucks, or it, for... it could be trucks, heavy, you know, Big okay. trucks that have to go long distances. So if you're driving from Chicago to New York, 
you know, with a, a large truck. Yeah, you're not going to use electrical uh, electricity is not going to solve that problem for local for trucks and a local delivery, you know, like your Amazon delivery truck or whatever it may be. Those right. can be electrified. So small local deliveries, you could electrify that. But when you got a big heavy right. truck that's got to go many hundreds of miles, um, right. you know, on a run, the electricity is not going to be the solution, at least not any time in the next few decades. Uh, um, okay, okay. Well, what if, if you're using hydrogen? What kind of what kind of um, what? Okay, let me come back and let somebody else answer them. Okay. He didn't really answer my question. That's why I'm asking. The question is, what kind of engine would you need to? What, what kind of engine would work? With Jake, this? there's two types of engines. One's a hydrogen fuel cell, and the other one's a typical internal combustion engine. Both can run on hydrogen. Okay. All right. Charlie, Charlie, go ahead. All right, uh, Alan, dating back to 1980, I saw the blueprints for a solar powered pyramid to be built on Lake Michigan using a uh, hydrogen production that would enable it large enough to produce, meet the energy, electrical energy needs of the entire city of Chicago. Uh, is that feasible? Uh, well, you, again, you have the issues, you know, first you've got to, you can, you could probably create a facility that might generate enough uh, green hydrogen, but it has to be a very large facility. And then, then you have the issue of the infrastructure. You've got to move it from there to all the places that need it. So, you know, th there's <laughs> multiple issues there in uh, you know, that process. Well, instead of coal-fired plants, we fire them with the uh, hydrogen. I mean, it's it, it could be possible and you to have a large enough facility but have to be very large or have more multiple ones and but then you have to transport it you know you have to have the infrastructure and so you know at this point it's not cost competitive they're not going to do it but the idea is they're with both the new electric electrolyzers uh uh the designs improving their efficiency and then you know various other things uh, as you get build up in scale, you know, costs can come down and it can, can become uh, competitive. If it, it does, isn't competitive to start, you've got to probably have uh, subsidies initially uh, to encourage the, you know, transitions over to uh, new clean energy forms. You know, we, when we started with solar and wind farms and everything, they were not cost competitive, but there were various tax credits are things to encourage their adoption and now as you go up with scale you know you're able to bring their costs down you, both through new technologies there have been you know improved solar panels and all kind of other things and and manufacturing efficiencies you're able to drive down the costs and you can get more, more broad scale adoption and i'm sure with you know, green hydrogen, you're going to, it's going to be the similar type of things. You will, as you scale it up and, and there's going to be continually to be new, uh, you know, improvements in technology, the costs will come down and it will become competitive. But, you know, there, there are hurdles that have to be overcome as there are, you know, with uh, any other energy transition. All right, can I go? Um, yeah, this is Ellen again. Uh, yeah, you know, I said I would worked at People's Energy where we worked on- Excuse me, a cup of coffee, Ellen. I'm sorry that gets right, you yeah. time. The hydrogen fuel cells, and at the time it was for homes. I don't know, do you know anything about that? The idea was a little hydrogen fuel cell would be in your closet, and then that would be stored, um, you know, in your neighborhood. and. Uh, it seemed like a lot of the issues were 
you know. Uh, yeah, I know. mentioned that earlier that, uh, you know, for bad, that for store, storage of uh, green hydrogen, yeah, the fuel cells, you know, could be an answer and, and particularly for, you know, individual homes or other uh, smaller facilities. Yeah, there, it's, you know, uh, hydrogen fuel cells is, is one of the possible solutions. Uh, you know. Has there been much development in that area? Because I, you know, the cost, what is the cost per kilowatt, right? That they measure these things in and, um, also, you know, how it would compare to gas or electric and, but also um, the other issue, have you ever seen uh, what happened to the electric car? The yeah, I, I know the first, the EV1, yeah. The electric car, um, right, yeah. yeah the, you know, what the problem was lobbying, you know, the yeah. oil lobby, right? I mean, so do you know, have you looked into that at all? What are the chances of getting past that politically? You know, well, there, there's there's a number of the fossil fuel companies who said you know they'd like to get into creating green hydrogen and they're looking for tax credits and other things to support their you know uh, getting into creating green hydrogen. So uh, you know they they see this as you know if they have to make some transitions, this is a, an energy area that they could get into. But you know they're trying to get government help to do it because all these things, you know, again, are not, they're not cost competitive at this time, just like solar and wind was not cost competitive 20 years ago or other, whatever. And, you know, it's gonna, you have to, you have technology, you've got infrastructure, and you've got cost competitiveness. There's all these, you know, there's these hurdles are gonna happen. Developed, I know this was, I was there in 2000. So it's been 22 years, uh, you know, um, so it's not new, right? right. Um, this technology, uh, but so why hasn't nothing, anything happened thus far? If you look at history and uh, what the environmental scan, what are your, what are your barriers to development? Well, I went through those with various hurdles in my presentation. Not yeah. just technical, but you did you get into um, political, um, right? Yeah. Political well, I, I don't. I don't foresee that uh, there particularly being a political hurdle per se. Uh, you know, obviously you'll have arguments as to whether you're going to have, you know, various credits and so forth to help out a new technology before it becomes cost competitive. And you know, there are, you will have groups who will, will not want the. Who are opposed to <laughs> transitioning to a zero carbon uh, economy and will oppose tax credits just like they would oppose tax credits for solar uh, or wind or anything else. You know, right. so it's obviously a political climate change aspect. denial lobby, for instance, right? I don't know what's, I think that's more of a Republican issue, isn't it, to be in denial that there is climate change? Yes, uh, that's generally the, been the pattern, right? Right. So, okay. Um, Let's move on to uh, Bob Matter, and then we'll go to Ernie Norman. Yeah, Alan, uh, in your in your research, uh, did you uh, come across uh, you know comparisons of uh, um, let's say for economics and uh, and uh, uh, net uh, um, pollution or whatever for other alternative forms of energy like. Uh, biodiesel and uh, natural gas? Yeah, there. well, for like biodiesel, I mean, when we talk about some of these like the forms of transportation, they're gonna have to get to, they're not gonna be able to use electrification like, you know, as you can would, you know, cars and small trucks and, you know, things like, like that. Like, even like bio, and bio, right, so, but so biodiesel uh, or, or, or biofuels rather, uh, you know, could be other possibilities and you know there's groups that are working on other uh zero carbon uh fuels let's and say a biodiesel biodiesel and natural gas how do they compare to co2 emissions uh compared to like regular you know gasoline or diesel fuel are they much lower i mean i'm i i heard that the natural gas is much cleaner or much much better although it does emit some and then biodiesel, I'm pretty unfamiliar with, but I know it was a thing uh, several years ago. There was quite a bit of talk about it. Then it just kind of 
fell off the edge of the earth and I never hear about it anymore. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're using fossil fuels, there, you know, there's some like natural gas that are less, uh, have less CO2 usage than say oil, but uh, they're not, you know, they're not, you're still using carbon and you're still generating CO2. Sure. You know, a little bit, yeah. And, How about and, biodiesel? How does that fit in there? Well, I, I, you know, if it's totally from a bio and it's just operating a, a diesel engine, but with uh, biofuels that, that don't use any carbon, then that should be a, a, carbon, a, a carbon free type of uh, fuel. And so like, like a French fry oil, you know, they were, yeah. I saw, I saw a documentary where uh, Woody Harrelson drove across the country in a Winnebago fueled mm. by French fry oil. They would yeah. just stop at restaurants <laughs> and, and, dump their, and dump their grease in the thing and, you know, drive to the next town. Did he sell French fries oh. to the restaurant? Hey, how are you, Cat? You okay. Good. Good. All right. All right. Anyway, let's uh, let's get yeah, back to the main stuff. point. Go ahead. No background noise. Ooh. I'll get. I'll take. I got. I. I got it. I got it. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. So just again, there are other uh, zero carbon fuels that are trying or that they're working on developing. So green hydrogen is not the only possible solution. Uh, again, it's there. It's a matter of developing te technologies and then developing an infrastructure to um, deliver them. And you know, and it's a competitive competition between various solutions out there. And so, um, but there are certain parts of the uh, you know economy where uh, green hydrogen certainly looks like a possible solution and that's why i'm raising it but you know uh, again for transportation you may come up with uh, some other uh, biofuels that will turn out to be the preferred solution to green hydrogen that's possible so these are things being developed but you know there are certainly uh you know as i said companies like uh, airbus that's looking to build a you know commercial airline with the uh, to run on green hydrogen, so uh, they think it's a good uh, a good possibility. So, and they're you know, so what can I say? <laughs> there are there are parts of the economy where this looks like a good solution, but there are hurdles they have to overcome before it's going to be cost competitive and be doable. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, Ernie, you had a question. Go yeah. A uh, couple couple more. Uh, quick ones in the in the uh, hydrolysis process, the hydrogen gas is released, and then I assume the oxygen is also released. Is that correct? And if so, yeah. How do they separate? So now you've got gas bubbles coming up. How do they know which are hydrogen and oxygen? How do they separate them? They separate them and they get them in the separate uh, tanks, or they can just release the the oxygen if they want into the air or whatever. But they might the oxygen might get the, uh, you know, if, if you want to use that for commercial purposes, they could be putting that into tanks for, uh, you know, and transporting that for some place where they just need oxygen. You know? Right. My question, my question oh. is. Hydrogen is, hy hydrogen is lighter, so it'll go to the top. Ah, and oxygen okay. will go to the bottom. Is that, okay. Yeah. okay. But they, they often have, yeah, I've seen them where they have side by side Containers, so it, it, obviously the hydrogen going lighter goes up, but then it gets shift, you moved know, off. moved off to a, a, its own tank, and the oxygen to the other tank. So, yeah. another question: Are there actually airplanes running now? Uh, have there been prototypes of airplanes using hydrogen fuel? Uh, no, they have not yet developed those. Uh, they are working on the designs for them. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, all right. Mm -hmm. uh, Ernie, you went through. Uh, Charlie, you want another question? Go ahead. Yeah, Alan. It appears to me that green hydrogen has many parallels 
and appears to be a green alternative to petroleum. Uh, was development of green hydrogen kind of delayed or pushed back during the Republicans in Congress in Washington uh, for a few years because they're captive of the uh, big oil industry? Didn't that kind of push back uh, the development of these uh, this alternative, which seems to be in direct competition with petroleum? Yeah, uh, generally when you've had uh, conservative governments, which in you know in our country is the Republicans, they've generally been trying. To, they don't want to fund development of uh, new technologies that are carbon free because they've got uh, kind of a commitments to the uh, you know oil and gas industries to continue using their um, you know fuels as they now exist. So. Uh, obviously, the idea that you're going to either spend government money or put out various tax credits and so forth to, you know, for the development of these new technologies is something that the Republicans in this country generally have not been supportive of. There might be a few who are fine with, you know, the subsidies because, you know, if, as long as it's a private business that's doing the research and going to develop it, they're, they're okay with that. Uh, but uh, generally, uh, Republicans are less supportive of development of new carbon-free technologies, right? Because they have um, a greater commitment to the current oil and gas industry. Okay, um, is there any more questions? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Ellen. Um, have you checked out, I know like People's Energy was very interested in it. Have you ever done any research with the electric utilities or the gas companies, whether they're interested in helping with this uh, R&D? Uh, I have not specifically heard where they are interested in it. Obviously, uh, electrolyzers are going to use electricity, so the uh, uh, electric utilities are not going to be opposed to their, you know, delivering electricity for use on electrolyzers. Uh, but whether electric utilities would want to uh, you know have their own uh, plants for creating green hydrogen I have not heard of that but that I, you know maybe some uh, electric utilities would want to uh, you know diversify and you know get into having uh, creating such facilities but you know uh, time will tell on that they're, well they're the ones that develop like nuclear power and mm -hmm. In the past, right? The right. So solar and you know, so right. I think they'd be the, the yeah. Well, they, but yeah, but the green hydrogen is not being looked at as using as being used to create electricity, but to you know, it, it's it's a product that's going that uses electricity to, in its creation, and but is then used for various other you know, economic purposes, whether for transport of various heavy vehicles for long distances, or whether it's, you know, again, in the uh, furnaces for steel making or, uh, or, you know. Um, so you, so to use, they, they get the electricity from like a gas coal fired plant and then turn it into something else. Is, is that the, well, they, I to didn't be, pick to up be, on that. To be green one. hydrogen, they've got to get the electricity from a renewable energy source. So they, you know, that's, if they use electricity that comes from fossil fuels, then it's not green hydrogen. It might be blue hydrogen then, you know, if they were capturing the carbon. Uh, it would just you know, be hydrogen. What if it's just hydrogen? They could get it from a coal fire plant and put it over there. You know, well, that's gray hydrogen. And that's, you know, th there's a gray lot of places that you ha use gray hydrogen today. And that is, you know, that is not a uh, carbon-free fuel uh, or, or energy source or whatever. It creates, you know, uh, it, it's, use, it's releasing a lot of CO2. So that's it's not something, you know, we want to use in the long run. We're, I would say we're, wherever they have gray hydrogen being used, you know, something from- uh, but it, it would be- a We would like to see that changed over to green hydrogen in the future. Okay. What? Most of the hydrogen that's created and utilized today is gray hydrogen. It's, it's a split off the hydrogen from 
natural grass uh, uh, molecules, and they're using uh, usual, you know, and and if it, there's not nothing really, you know, clean about it. <laughs> so that's great. The gray hydrogen, which is what the most hydrogen used today is. So we, the idea is we got to get use green hydrogen. You both have to have, you know, split it away from water. You get the hydrogen from by splitting it off from water, and you have to use a renewable energy source for the electricity used in that process. Hmm. All right, Jim, I think we're about done. All <laughs> right. Um, anybody, any other further questions? Okay, if not, we're going to get into rebuttals then. Uh, Let's thank our speaker. Yeah, thanks, Alan, for doing stuff. Who has got a re who's got a rebuttal tonight? Okay, who has got a rebuttal? All right, Charlie. Who else has a rebuttal? I guess I'll do one. I Bob and uh, Ellen. Um, who else? So I have Charlie, Bob, Ellen, um, Ernie. Uh, anybody else? Sh Sharon, Steve, Jake. We've had all our yeah, questions. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. I think we got all our questions answered. Okay, I'm going to go Bob first, second, Selen, and then Charlie third. Give you guys about each about six minutes right now, since we do have a little time left. I'm not. I'm not ready yet, Tim. Oh no. Okay, Bob, you go after. Uh, well, Ellen, we'll go. You you go first, then. Okay, and then we'll put Bob second, and then Charlie third, unless Charlie you want to go first. I'll go. All right, Ellen, go ahead. I'll give you six minutes. Okay. Um, right. It, okay. Uh, you know, thanks for your talk. Um, my concern is that it sounds like this is, I don't know, kind of almost a distraction from what is really needed. I mean, it, you know, if we assume that climate change is real and it, you know, um, and we do need to meet these UN these UN standards and reduce it by 1.5% or, or temperature degrees. Um, we, uh, it needs to be all in and um, not just a little, you know, this could happen if somehow something, you know, um, so it sounds like, uh, it, and also I have a concern about this idea that you use energy, I mean, it seemed feasible to me, this idea of fuel cells, but I thought they created electricity from water and really no, no, no other energy source was available. So that's the micro turbine idea that was being developed at People's Energy in 2000. Um, like I said, they, they said if Al Gore had gotten in, we would have had a better chance. Um, I, you know, and or if we listen to Jimmy Carter back, you know, in the 80s, we'd have a better chance. Uh, I, without uh, almost a, you know, a law, we're we're going to have a. This isn't going to work. So the solution that I I really have seems to explain everything to me is that there's a an invisible supply side. These are the um, you know this invisible shadow government, the military. You know, they've been part of the CIA and MI6 and um, Mossad, the intelligence agencies. You know, these guys, these, these, you know, Elon Musk even, you know, this is a $30 trillion being spent, you know, for them to get away with their monopoly takeover of the world. And so, you know, we first have to deal with that. But, um, and, you know, I, I guess so, there's so many... It, it all comes from the supply side, and I, it frustrates me. This, I, I've studied marketing research, and I, um, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I assumed there was a supply and a demand. And the CEO of People's Gas was open to these ideas, but it, it's got to come really from the very top. It had to be Al Gore gets to be president, and then we signed the treaty with the UN, and. Um, and, uh, you know, you put in a law that they can't just ignore. 
I, I, right now also the military, I had some hope at one point that the military was green. I, I heard a talk at the Chicago Area Peace Action. I thought, you know, they go, you know, yeah, they, they you know, if they want to go green, that's good. But it, it seems like they're greenwashing it, you know, and um, this is uh, sadly we're they're just lying to us everything and um, about everything. It's for, we have to start with the government doesn't get to lie to us, take over the public estate, it, uh, you know, admit that it is a Nazi fascist takeover. It has been. They've assassinated a lot of people. But, you know, short term. Yeah, I try to I've been working recently with the. Um, removed from the war machine. And um, they did see that the teachers union divested from the energy uh, from fossil fuel machine. And so, and we're trying to get them to divest from the big war machine, the manufacturers. We got to, we've got to get them to stop. You know, what do teachers have to do with energy um, usage? Well, they're gonna, they got a lot of money and the money is in the pension. So we're trying to divest, like the divest sanction movement, you know, um, and that might just, it, it, does, uh, it does get people's attention. Um, but we're trying to get the aldermen to agree with it. Uh, that'd be a good talk. These are people that I met through here at the college. And um, I mean, I, I do, it, I think it's also, they've got us convinced, you know, a lot of little happy hippies at the bottom, you know, like little blades of grass trying to bite off, you know, it's like Avatar movie, you know, what is the chances of us little hippies, you know, who are all atomized and separated from the demand side, you know, I mean, they'd start by saying, is there any demand for this thing, you know, and people go, well, how much does it cost? And they go, uh, well, you know, we were almost there, you know, the government helps us. And, you know, meanwhile, I, I, my understanding is too late for all of this anyhow. So that's all I got. Okay, um, that's fine. Now I noticed, Brian, you also raised your hand, so I assume you want a rebuttal too as well. All right, Bob, are you ready to go now or not? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so, okay, so I'm going to share the screen. I went over, uh, found a, uh, uh, I found a website. Whoops. Uh, share screen at the bottom. Let's see. I'm going to bring up my my screen. And now, can you share my screen? Uh, uh, it should, it, you should be able to do it from your Zoom. On well, the bottom, you should see share screen, and then go ahead. Well, that's well. Actually, when I when I'm on my screen, then that my menu erases, and I can't find the. Uh, hang on, let me let me do something different here. Let me if go. Not, I can pull the website up and share it for you. Okay, so I'm going to share desktop or application. It's asking me what I want to share. Share your desktop. Share desktop. And then just okay. open the application. And now it says share your entire screen. Yes. Okay, share. My, my options are cancel and share. And the only thing that's share. highlighted is cancel. Uh, and, well, there we go. Now it says share. Okay. There we okay. go. Can you, can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Can you see that chart? Okay. So this is a chart of various biodiesel fuels and their comparison to traditional fossil fuels on the bottom. And this is grams of carbon dioxide produced per megajoule of energy. And this was produced in the UK. But uh, so we can see that uh, natural gas, uh, which is the top one here, I'm, I was kind of surprised at that, produces 62 grams of carbon di dioxide per megajoule of energy. I, I didn't know it was that high. So, I mean, it is, it is cleaner than, uh, than diesel or gasoline, but it's still, you know, it's still sort of, sort of high, but it is, it is an improvement. I mean, I can see switching buses to natural gas and things like that. Uh, it would, it would definitely put us in the right direction. Um, but, uh, boy, what's really interesting though, is though up here at the very top cooking oil and tallow only 13 grams of carbon dioxide produce per megajoule of energy that is uh i think pretty uh pretty interesting and worth and worth taking a look at and i did find another website i won't bother trying to share the screen with it but i did find another website that said that um human fat could be used as a biofuel so we are really in luck there 
I mean, you know, uh, you know, Jay Pritzker could could pro- probably power an ocean liner, you know, 20, 30 trips to China and back. So that would be something to look at. Um, now, the other thing is this whole business, you know, like now Biden running us off the cliff here into this, you know, he's sending us into a, what, probably a coming depression with, uh, you know, with his uh, cutting of all this oil, uh, you know, drilling and everything immediately. You know, it, there is no climate emergency. I mean, from 1850 to now, yeah. The climate's in, the, the temperature change has been about has been nine tenths of a degree Celsius, which is not that big of a deal. Baloney. Uh, and well, that's what that's what all the you know all the, look at all the charts, all the data. They all show the same thing. You know, we're up about nine tenths, and we had a little spike there during World War II, and you know, and about half of that gain is is since then. Not you know maybe four you know four tenths of a percent. You know, so, but, you know, World War II was kind of a out of, you know, that was kind of a, you know, outlier event because of the war. Um, so we're only, you know, but like I said, we're only, you know, four tenths of a degree warmer than that. So again, well, again, not news. such, the, not a big emergency that everybody's making. And they're, they're, they're looking at uh, all the ah. charts that these scientists are using. Um, there's, they have the chart that like almost everybody uses uh, the 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 algorithms that are all predicting this worst case scenario of how horrible it's going to be in a few years. However, there's one model that is much more accurate, but nobody wants to use, and that's called the Russian model. And if you look at what the Russian model has predicted and what actually has happened, they are very close. But for some reason, nobody wants to use that model. What's Everybody. The, what, what's the Russian model? Well, there's there's different. They have different forecasting uh, algorithms or pro- computer programs to forecast the future temperatures. And yeah. in the United States, uh, you know, in most other countries, they, they use this uh, kind of, uh, you know, average of a bunch of different models and they, they predict a much higher uh, temperature than the Russian model. And, but the thing is the Russian model has been much more accurate uh, over time than, than these other models that are used. Now, if you do it a Google, away. Search, it the, 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 well, it, they're forecasting a lower temperature rise and they, and they've been, you know, and it's been accurate, uh, for, for several years. It, it's been in line with the Russian model, not the, not the compendium of models that the rest of the world uses. The, rest yeah, of the, world, the, Russian, Russia, the Russians, the Russians are Russia? the Russians are major suppliers of oil and natural gas for most yeah. of Europe. Yeah. Well, anyway, well, you can go if you if you do a good search for or do a YouTube search for the Mark Levin uh, interview with uh, he interviewed uh, uh, an expert in all in in climate change, and uh, you'll you can hear read about all that in there. I'm He's sure. A maniac. If you, I'm sure if you I'm sure if you search for uh, for my, Michael Levin and uh, and uh, uh, you know climate change and Russian model, I'm sure you'd, I'm sure you'd find it. It's quite interesting. And the guy's really uh, I mean he's got all the credentials. He's got all kinds of degrees. He's been working in in uh, this you know climate change business for for decades in universities and all that. So anyway, so that's quite good. Quick. Now, no, no, quick, stop. Quick, quick. Hush up. Okay. Quit, quit interrupting what? me. Quit, in, quit interrupting okay. here. If I can Sorry. Finish my Sorry. Oh, um, good. The, good. Other is, uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, you know, in, a lar- in the over the long term view, however, no matter what's going to happen, is not good because of the um, because we're getting we're getting dumber. The, there's not there's fewer and fewer smart people coming down the horizon and <laughs> this would be a big problem for for all kinds of thing things but uh but if you look at like for especially for things like the energy grid and uh things like you know running the nuclear plants and running the power plants and things that really seriously take brains that you can't get you know you can't just having black skin uh, or being a, a transgender uh, does not qualify you to uh, operate and design uh, energy grids 
and uh, and these sophisticated uh, kind of power systems. And uh, so we're kind of running, uh, you know, towards a, uh, a brick wall, but we'll leave that for a, another discussion. Maybe I'll give a presentation on it, but essentially, you know, we've lost several IQ points since uh, the year 1600 and uh and there's just there's no end in sight so uh that that movie you might want to look at that movie idiocracy because that that's actually uh you know got a lot a lot of truth to it the only the thing that's more false about it is it's going to happen a lot sooner than the movie predicts okay that's it for me yeah all right hey, there... thanks bob uh jake Dumb, dumb dumbness dumbness jake, is, dumbness jake. Is... Jake, yeah. it's rebuttal time. If you want to go, I'll put you yeah. on the schedule. Okay, okay. I'll put Sorry. you down for six minutes, but uh, okay. we got Brian okay. next. So, Brian, go ahead. Okay. And if you can stop your share, Bob, I can do that for you if you want. Oh, I mean, uh, let's see. At the How top of I... your screen, just stop share. Right at the uh, top. Oh, oh, okay, stop share. Okay. Yeah, and then we go. Okay, uh, Brian, you're up. So, go ahead. So it's like the only way this works is if the government spends a huge amount of money, gets, you know, passes some laws, engages in these public private partnerships that take taxpayer money and hand it out to these big companies, you know, exacerbating the wealth gap, giving big corporations more power and more control. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like if it's effective and it, the market demands it, then the private industry will create it. Um, I, I don't want to, I don't want you guys spending any of my money. I don't want, you know, this carbon, this, you know, this boogeyman of carbon. I mean, carbon is everywhere. Carbon feeds the plants. You know, we breathe carbon. <clears throat> like, you know, I, I mean, if, if you're worried about pollution, I mean, isn't that the EPA, your old buddy government was supposed to be handling that like 50 years ago? So if, you know, climate change is an issue, you know, blame your old buddy government and, and don't spend any of my money on, on this tech, this, you know, inefficient, uh, not market driven technology. Thank you. Brian, do you breathe carbon? <laughs> We we breathe, we exhale <laughs> CO2. What kind of species hey, are you? We exhale CO2, buddy. You I mean, we carbon. You exhale carbon. It. You want to control carbon? Control the population. I, I mean, it's like, you know, people exhale carbon, you know, all these commies, you know, they want it, unlimited control over carbon, right? That's every person that exhales in this entire world. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Stevie, are, are, are you done? Okay, uh, Brian, are you done then? Okay, Jake, go ahead. I'll let Charlie go last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, carbon is not a communist issue. Everybody who 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 breathes uh, does so, regardless of of, of political ideology. Uh, I will respond to something that Bob said. Um, yeah, it, 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 we're, we're getting dumb and dumber, um, but that's not a racial issue. Um, they had programs on television yesterday. This marks the 30th anniversary of the great Chicago flood. Uh, there weren't any blacks involved. There, there was a daily administration, and they're all a bunch of dumb white guys who didn't know what they were doing. Um, uh, getting back to the issue at hand, um, yeah, I, I think there's possibility with the... Um, hydrogen fuel cell, but um, I wouldn't make it a panacea. My, my problem with, with creating green hydrogen is that it sounds like it, it takes tremendous amount of... Um, tremendous, oh, one other thing I wanted to ask, Bob. Um, when you, when you, 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 were, you were saying something about um, Joe Biden, I didn't, I didn't catch the, uh, uh, I didn't catch the uh, entire um, uh, reference there what, what were you talking about there oh that uh the fact that uh joe biden just kind of ran us off the cliff by uh you know his first day in office uh stopping the keystone pipeline uh pulling all these uh uh drilling permits you know banning drilling in the uh in the arctic banning offshore drilling and all this stuff 
that's what initially started forcing fuel prices up. And now the, you know, now the war in Ukraine just, you know, added fuel to the fire. But he's treating this like, you know, he's trying to stop this overnight, this carbon stuff, to appease the... Uh, uh, okay, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, okay I, that's enough. I want to respond yeah. to that. He, he, he may have done it on day one, but more recently... He's calling for. He's actually calling for more offshore oil drilling. He's called. He's given more offshore oil drilling permits. He's stopping the the the, the dr- oil drilling in 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 Alaska because there really isn't the, in particular in the Arctic because there's very little oil in the Arctic uh, uh, nature ref, uh, re, uh, refuge. Um, there, there's not enough oil there to make it even worth it. Um, but no, the, the, he is increasing offshore oil drilling, and in order in order to offset the, the the situation in Ukraine, so it's a combination of things there. I don't think I don't think fuel prices went up after Biden took office. It, it's more recent than that. It's more it's, it's since oh, they, uh, the situation in Ukraine. Um, but uh, getting getting back to the issue at hand, um, I, I I think the. Uh, hydrogen fuel cells may have some promise, but when you're talking about when you're talking about using hydrogen, um, like for airplanes, it, it, liquefied hydrogen is what it sounds like you're talking about. It takes it sounds like it's very energy intensive process in order to create that to begin with. It's, it just the like opposite. It takes, just the opposite. How so? Yeah, it's easy. It would take a lot. It sounds like it takes gobs of electricity just to create it. No, no, no. How so? How so? How much electricity would it take to create it? Very little. That's why you can use solar to do it, Jake. Okay, you use solar electricity. Okay, all right. No. Well, that's what I asked before. How much electricity would it take right. to create enough enough high enough hydrogen fuel to run, say, a plane or a uh, plane or a ship with? Okay, uh, I don't know if our speakers responded to it, but are you done, Jake, with your rebuttal? No, no. Yeah. We're, we're, we're on our response on that one. Alan, well, do you have any idea? Period. Yeah, it's it's not a question period. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not sure if you wanted me to respond to any of these or no, no. But, you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, sure. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just, okay, okay, hold okay, on Jake, a second, Jake, okay, okay, Jake. okay. Let me, let me, let me finish then. Um, um yeah, I'm, all I'm saying he has some promise, but I'm skeptical of it. Okay, that's fine. All right, uh, Charlie, you're the last rebutter, so. Uh, oh, could I have just a half a minute? Certainly. Take it, uh, uh, Margaret. I'll just uh, let you go before Charlie does because he usually likes to go last. So, okay, please that's just fine. go ahead and take your take your time. Okay, I'll put you. No, I just a... I just wanted to tell Alan I'm I'm glad I um that we're seeing him again. We used to know him from the Second Unitarian Church, and from the yeah Eth- ethical society. I don't remember where you you came and you talked about um anyway uh collective housing up in Oregon or Washington state or something. And it was a really nice thing, but that's been a long time since we've, we've seen you. And Frank Aguilar is my husband and I'm Margaret Aguilar. And so um, Frank is so uh, not participating in a lot of this now, but at any rate, I'm, I'm glad to see you. And that's really all I wanted to say, thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm just letting people, I have to, I'll probably be getting off by eight because uh, my partner is going to use our our desktop here for some stuff that she's got to do for her work. So uh, yeah. I kind of told her I can get off around by probably about eight. So uh, just oh, okay. Yeah, I, yeah. okay, so oh. Charlie, go. All right, Charlie, you've okay. got your rebuttal now. So go ahead. All right, I'd like to thank our speaker uh, for uh, for saying this and the Unitarian Universalist for pursuing ecological issues. I'll be eclectic as usual here in my capacity as a public transit and trains advocate. I'm aware of the topic of transportation. We have a, uh, a, a, a tra- an economy that's based 
enormously on transportation modes, planes, trains, uh, buses, trucks, uh, and uh, almost all of that is petroleum, petroleum based transportation over 90 some percent. Um, it, it's something has to be done about it and attendant uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, transportation is the number one source, number one source of greenhouse gases uh, in, in the world. And we're producing all of it, uh, even though Brian seems to think these are breathable. Uh, the arguments, I'll get around to it. The arguments about wind and solar clean energy was that they were intermittent. And the number one problem was storage, uh, which this approach tries to solve. It has application for transportation and solves some of the issues regarding storage. Uh, and it is what is considered uh, a, an alternative. I mean, an alternative method uh, that has applications, perhaps not in every application, as he outlined several times, but there are applications in which it is most suitable. Uh, and those definitely need to be pursued. Um, I, in regarding Bob Matter, I'd like to tell him that once a week, the, uh, Burling, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad picks up tank cars of tallow from the remaining stockyard facilities on the south side. However, I don't think enough tallow is produced to meet the energy needs of the United States. Yeah, I have gone out on Saturdays to see their uh, pickup. They do street running once a week to pick up tank cars of tallow from the meat producing industry. Uh, that's basically it. There's an awful lot of nonsense out there regarding energy. I would not consider sources such as talk radio, uh, conservative talk radio, as a reliable source of information on this also. And this Russian, uh, anyone who goes to the Russians for information, I, I, I shouldn't kill the messenger, but I'm not certain if we should give much validity to things coming out of Russia regarding energy policy. <laughs> thank yeah, you thank very you. much, Alan. Hope to see you again. Thank you. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. Everything coming out of Russia right now is propped up. I'm not hearing yeah, it very well, Tim. Jim. Alan, you it's get the last word. word. Okay. okay. Get the last word. Okay. All right, Alan. So you just wrap up. Yeah, uh, I, we'll wrap up yeah, I'm, yeah. I listened to the various. Uh, I don't know if they're called rebuttals. A lot of them were not really rebutting what I was saying. They were just, you know, commentary on uh, on thoughts. Um, you know, on one hand, Ellen was saying, "Well, it's not here right now." <laughs> you know, so it's not worth anything. Uh, you know, all these things take time to, to develop. And you're talking about another person talking about uh, the military. Obviously, if we're going to a lot of the military applications, you're not going to be able to electrify, uh, you know, heavy things or, or big airplanes. So they're going to have to develop whether it's green hydrogen or some other uh, zero carbon fuels for the military if they're going to be uh, reducing their carbon usage. Um, so there's things like that I can comment on, but a lot of it was not really related to the presentation I made you doing where it's not really well so I'm not gonna comment on that. That's all I'm gonna say. Okay. Um I'd like to pass on uh I'm gonna quickly do a share screen at the end of this video just to show you where you can get a little more information on the hydrogen economy. There's an excellent book out by a gentleman by the name of Jeremy Rifkin. He wrote it back in 2002 and uh there is a link I can put it in the chat, but I'm going to share the screen with you real quick just to show you uh, where he's at. That back in 2002, he wrote a book. Uh, it was um, it was a uh, 
I'll check as soon as I can get it. Damn C-SPAN. These ads are driving they, they, these ads are driving me nuts with C-SPAN, but he wrote a book called The Hydrogen Economy, and he gives a book, uh, a good talk on his book on um, what, what it's all about, and he gets into a lot more detail on how the hydrogen economy should be implemented and everything. I'll uh, put the link in the chat real quick for it, just to make sure that everybody has it if they want to see it real quick. Um, but otherwise, uh, Alan, one recommendation for you, get to know this topic a lot more in detail, if you can. Um, I know I've been through, uh, you know, the old, the same thing with thorium nuclear power. I just know a lot about it. I know you're trying yourself that you might see hydrogen as a good bridge fuel, but, um, like I said, I just want to see a lot more research and a lot more stuff. And I would recommend that that Jeremy Rifkin book might be a good place to start for you to really dig into it a little more. Um, as I said, I will put that link for the uh, in the chat right now for that uh, hydrogen economy video that's on C-SPAN. It was written back in 2002. And he does give a very good, um, a very good thing. I just put it in there. So if you guys want to do it. At this point, then I'm going to set adjourn the college tonight, and then I'll keep the Zoom call open for anybody else who would like to sit around and chat for a little while. So, at yeah, this I'm, point, goodbye. the college of complexes is adjourned, and uh, yeah, I just wanted.